Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship this morning. It's uh, great to be gathered once again in the room. If we haven't met before, I'm the Reverend Graham Anson. I'm the minister here at Colmore Uniting. It's great to be uh, together in this space, in this room, um, hearing God's word for us this morning. A couple of quick notes as I get going. One is that Isabel is online. So good to have you with us, Isabel. And Isabel's um, thanking Judy for last week for lighting the candle for her. There we go. Um, the other word I want to say up front is if, uh, if you're sitting at home or if you're in the room and you're thinking, oh gee, I've seen that shirt before. Um, <laughs> it is true, you may well have seen that shirt before, especially if you're a stylish XL in men's. Um, I'm wearing an op shop sh uh, shirt this morning, so uh, <laughs> very proud to do so. So uh, yeah, so if you're a stylish XL, you might be going, oh, I've seen that shirt before. Yeah, you have. <laughs> All right. Well, come, let's, uh, let's worship God. Um, yeah. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, Judy? I said I didn't even recognise it. Oh, there you go. All right. No. Well, it's great to be gathered this morning. Uh, let's come to hear, um, let's come in community to hear God uh, with each other. Let's come to hear God's word, um, spoken, sung. Let's join in God's movement in our community together today. As we gather each week, uh, we acknowledge country. So today we, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the people of the Dharawal Nation. We pay respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people of this land. Lord, may your work be done in reconciliation and justice. And this morning, Wendy's going to come and light the candle for us. Thank you, Wendy. Good morning, everyone. I'm lighting the candle this morning in memory of June Wilson, right? She was a very loyal and loving member of this congregation for many years, went to live in Melbourne, and um, when we returned on Friday, we got a message from her son saying that June had passed away. And he'd found a memory box in which all of the letters and cards and so forth that we'd written over the years that June had been away, um, she'd, he'd found them and so contacted me saying that June had died. And so today we light a candle for June, a past member of our congregation, a loving, caring, wonderful, compassionate lady in her memory and rest in peace. You are the light of the world. May the light of Christ shine here this morning and lead us to good works. Give and give glory, glory to God. God. Our reading this morning includes this phrase, this little passage out of Matthew 5.16 about letting our light shine. And of course our light shine when we take on the light of Christ in our lives. So let's sing this morning, Christ be our light. Let's stand together.
Let's come to God in prayer. And our prayer this morning uh, is really uh, heavily dripped in, um, soaked in uh, Psalm 112. Let's pray. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord. Happy are those who are in awe of God, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. Praise the Lord. Lord, we pray this morning that we'll be, we will be open to being lost in your awesomeness and wonder. That our hearts will take delight in the heart of your law and commandments that lead us to life. We pray that our lives might seek that which is right with you. We pray that our souls might seek graciousness, mercy and integrity, generosity and justice, and that we will be steadfast and true in your truth of life found following in the way of Jesus that leads us to you. Be with us this morning, we pray. In the name of Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite you, if you're able, to please stand. We're going to pass the peace. My friends, may the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding be with you now and evermore. Thank you. So I invite you where you are just to pass the peace with those around you. Peace be with you. I think at this point, the, those children who are going to go with Judy out to jam are free to leave. Thank you. And I'm going to invite John, who's already here, to uh, come and bring our readings this morning. Thank you, John. The first reading is from Isaiah 58, from verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You, you shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. 
Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise up the found, raise up the foundations of many generations. It shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. And from Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, from verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfil. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, John. Well, this morning, um, I've chosen not to take the low-hanging fruit. I've chosen not to take the easy way. It would be really easy for me just to preach on salt and light. That's the easy passage, and I think every time I've, I've ever preached on this passage before, I've always taken the salt and light route. It's an, easy, it's, it's, it's an easy place to land a sermon. But today I thought I might make my life a little more difficult, and uh, <laughs> I don't know why. But this morning I want to preach on the law, as it turns up in the scriptures this morning. So buckle up, here we go. Jesus had a really interesting relationship with the law with the religious law as it was in his time. It turns up in scripture, particularly, it's there, it's right through. The law itself, as Jesus was living within it, because he was a Jew, and the more we try to distance ourselves from that, the more we lose the heart of what Jesus is saying. Because Jesus himself was a Jew. He was born a Jew, he died a Jew. And Jesus himself saw himself as obedient to the law. With caveats. But the law as Jesus, as it came to Jesus, was already about between 1500 and 1200 years old. The law had started to be instigated by Moses. And Jesus knew that he was living with a law that was developed in different times to those he was living in. The context was different. The government was different. Jesus was living in a time that was was like a theocracy, where the government of his time was ruled, or the, the, the leadership of the nation as as Israel kind of were, the Jews were, was a theocracy. In other words, they saw themselves as being led by God or by the clergy. But Moses, in his time, and for the first number of years of the life of Israel as a nation, when it became a nation, was what's known as a kritarchy, ruled by the judges. It moved into being a monarchy 
ruled by kings. And now they were again in a monarchy ruled by an emperor. And there'd been all these shifts about, you know, in, in that, that's just one of the shifts. I mean, if you want to know the difference, like in Australia here, we live in what's called a representative, demo, representative democracy. I don't know how well you feel represented, but we're in a representative democracy. So Jesus was living in different, even a different context to us. And we should keep that in mind when we're interpreting scripture. Other things that were different was that the law, as, as we have it in the scriptures, was religious law. It was there to help the people understand how they, would, how they could please God. But it covered a whole range of areas that we, um, 3,000 years later from when it was written down, or more than 3,000 years, we, we've, we've categorised all these bits of law. But the law in the scripture covered things like business law, contract law, civil law, criminal law, family law, marriage law, property law. All those kind of things were all gathered into the religious law because it was all seen that when you were being a good citizen, you were pleased in God. And if you want to know how that's different to, for instance, to us now, ask yourself when you get a speeding fine, where do you pay your money to? It doesn't come to the church. I wish it did, <laughs> but it doesn't. So the times were very, very different. And the religious law, all those, all those little categories of law were all seen as religious law. If you want to know a little bit of, get a bit of an understanding of, what, of the law as Jesus walks into it and encounters it in the, in the first century... The times had shifted even from Moses to Jesus. If you just think everything in the Bible is all about the same, it's all, a, it's all a level playing field, it's all just a plateau, well, life had changed dramatically even, those, even in those, three, even in those sorry, 1,500 or, or 1,200 years. The people had gone from being nomads, wandering around in the desert, to living in cities. They were living in rural and urban settings. They'd gone from being polytheistic to monotheistic. So in that time, they developed this sense of there was, there was a whole bunch of gods and now there was one God. The changes had shifted where it was okay to sacrifice humans to appease the gods or to appease God. And that had shifted. It had shifted to livestock. This is all in the space of about 1,500 years. It had shifted from humans to livestock and in Jesus' time it was poultry. You might remember when Jesus walks into the marketplace, it, it talks about him tipping up the tables and there were birds and that, pigeons and that sort of stuff. They'd gone from being having a tabernacle, which was a travelling tent where you, where you could encounter God, to the temple. So it was located in one place, in Jerusalem, in one city. And you had to make pilgrimages. So instead of God travelling with you, there was a sense that if you, wanted to encounter, if you really wanted to encounter God, you went to the one place, to the temple. They'd gone from being tribes to a nation. So can you see what I'm saying? Even in those 1,500 years, there'd been a whole lot of shift in how the law should or could have been applied. And the law was a complex organism. Well, it should have been an organism. It was more like a, a static. It was treated like a static by the people in power. It was treated statically by the people in power. In other words, not really going anywhere. You had to interpret it you had to encounter it and interpret it, how it applied 1,300 years later, 1,500 years earlier, sorry. And it was continually being written down by scribes. Like these days we photocopy it or we, we, we scan it and put it in our computers and pass it around. But in their day, the scribes wrote down the law and it was interpreted by the rabbis and they would write little notes on the side, which was known as midrash. So they would do their own little sort of contextual interpreting of it along the way. Have I bored you yet? Has anyone really gone to sleep? <laughs> All right. Okay. So it was, and it was preached, taught by the rabbis. And it was reinforced by the clergy. It was reinforced and enforced by the clergy, by the Pharisees. The, the ruling body of the, of the clergy was mostly made up 
by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they interpreted it very literally. So in other words, what applied 1,500 years earlier has to apply today. You have to, like whatever, no matter what the difference between what life was like, you have to apply it exactly the same way today. Now, there were 10 commandments and there were 613 laws. And so if you wanted to try and please God, you were trying to stick to 623 different laws and commandments to, t- to keep God happy. And if you failed to do so, there would be a Pharisee there to let you know what you'd done wrong. The law was something you encountered. I've, exp- I've, exp- I've expressed this before. It's like an electric fence. You know it when you hit it. That's how the law worked. And if you hit it, if you bounced off that fence, that electric fence called the law, you were shamed. Your honour was, was reduced. You're standing in the temple. You're standing in the... And, and you could break the law by being a woman and menstruating and, and turning up and sitting next to a male on a bench. You could break the law in a number of different ways in terms of, uh, you know, on all the interpretations of the law that came into being. So untying your donkey would have been seen as work on the Sabbath. You've broken the law. Unless you could find up, come up with an excuse or a reason which might have fitted into the law. Like you see what I mean? It's this kind of, everyone's trying to, trying to make the law work from a, a law that's now 1,300, 1,500 years old, trying to make it work in the first century. And there's a whole kind of business and industry around it because the Pharisees made a whole lot of profit out of the penalties that applied when you broke it. It's into this context that Jesus walks and starts to talk about the law. And like many others, he's trying to do a job of interpreting the law in its own context, when it was written, in the times that it was written, He's trying to reinterpret it for the context and times that he is in. He's trying trying to, or sometimes he's trying to help people find the correction of the law. Like, in other words, this is how you're interpreting it now, but this is what the law really meant. And that's where he got himself into trouble quite regularly. Because Jesus is doing contextual work And he's saying that context is different. So that law doesn't apply the same way. You've misunderstood things. And he was standing up against a religious power base who was saying, no, the law stands exactly as it is written down. And you will obey it. You're you're not pleasing God because, again, remember, it's a theocracy, so they're the ones in charge. So you are actually doing things that are not pleasing to God by not reading the scripture as we have it then, which was the first five books, what's known as the Pentateuch. If you're not reading that and acting and living it out as literally as you receive it from 1,200 years, 1,500 years ago, then you are not pleasing God. You can see, hopefully, that it's a complex situation that Jesus walks into. And Jesus is courageous enough to be contextual. Jesus is courageous enough to interpret and reinterpret and correct the law where it needed to be done. Where literalism was being used as a power to oppress the people, In a theocracy where everyone was trying to understand how they were going to be pleasing to God or how they could please God, I mean, we don't live in that kind of time now. If you tell people, if you try to enforce a religious law on people, they go, stuff you, I'm going to the beach. I I don't need to please God. I don't need to please your God. You see, very different times. But Jesus was living in a time when people were trying to understand where they sat with God. 
and how they could keep God pleased. And he was prepared to stand in the face of the law and say, you know what? You're interpreting this incorrectly. This is not what this means. Or even if that's what it means, that's what it meant for those people. But it means, it has to mean something different, but it has to be applied differently now. I think if the church in the modern era had grasped that concept 100 or 200 years ago, we'd be in a much healthier place than we are right now. Literalism used as a power over to try and control people is exactly what Jesus was standing against. And Jesus says to them, you know what, you can reject what I've got to say here or how I'm trying to lead you. Put yourself under the law if you like. But you're going to have to do a better job of it than the Pharisees. And you're going to have to do a better job of it than the Sadducees. You're going to have to do better than they do at trying to be righteous. Because they've turned the word of God into a power for their own benefit. You're going to have to do better than that if you want to try and live just by the law. But on the other hand of it, what we need to also understand is that Jesus very clearly says, and this is where I want to try and land things today, or this is the pivot point, is that Jesus says very clearly that he did not come to abolish the law. And we need to understand that. The Old Testament has value for us. Because Jesus' faith is embedded there. It's his religion that he's growing up with. It's the faith of his um, forebears that he inherits. And Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to fulfil them. What on earth does you think that might mean? Because I've met different Christian people with different interpretations of what that means. And I'm not going to go there today, but I know some people would take that to mean that Jesus is referring to his death as a sacrificial kind of fulfilment. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is saying is that all that is the law and the commandments I am embodying right now and I am teaching you. While I am in your presence, I am teaching you, I am embodying what, it, what God really wants us to know, what, who God really wants us to be. If you want to know it, then this is the way. That's what Jesus is saying when he says he's fulfilling the law. He's not abolishing it, he's not doing away with it, he's just distilling it into himself, into his own way of being and inviting us to follow in that way. You see, when Jesus is asked to sum up the law, and you're gonna, you're, you, you can tell me what this all is. You'll know this off by heart. What does, when Jesus is asked what the greatest commandments are, what the greatest laws are? Love? Right? Yeah, so love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. Where do they come from? Do you think Jesus made those up? No, they don't come from the Ten Commandments. Do you know where they come from? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength is one little part of the law. It's in the, it's in, you can look it up for yourself. It's in Deuteronomy. It's, um, I've got it written down. I had, I'm, it, I'm pretty sure it's Deuteronomy 6.15. There it is. Deuteronomy 6.15 says exactly, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbour as you love yourself. Now it says it in Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew. I don't know exactly if that's what it was saying, but that's, that's how we get it in English. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and love your neighbour as you love yourself. Jesus has gathered that in out of the law. Likewise, love your neighbour as you love yourself, comes from the book of Leviticus. 
chapter 19, as, as we have it, chapter 19, verse 18. And Jesus is saying, I am distilling down for you. I'm, I'm turning this into an easy formula and I'm living it out right in front of you. This is how you do it. This is who I am. This is where you will find life. He goes a little further, and I, and I won't bang on too much hard on, too hard about this, but there is this thing called righteous, just, righteous justice. Or, um, yeah, right, righteous justice. And we copped a bit of it this morning in Psalm 112, and we copped it again in Isaiah 58. And if you want to know what really gets God up in the morning, what God gets up for, if you want to know what it's like to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbour as you love yourself, then one of the core things, Jesus says very clearly, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. And the prophets in particular were the ones who went on about justice, as did the psalm writer at times. This whole sense of loving your neighbour requires you to look sideways, to look to the people around you and to say, where can my good works, again, coming out of Matthew chapter 5, let your light shine, let your good works show to give glory to God. Where can my light shine? Well, your light shines when you look to those around you and you're prepared to take on systems that oppress. Now, it, that's, that's what, how we get it this morning from Jesus. And my friends, that's kind of where I want to land things this morning. I feel like that might be enough. That we can try and live by every law. And I have met a number of Christians who think their job is to be lawyers. Who, thinks who think they're God's lawyer in the, on the earth to make sure that everybody's obeying, you know, that all the different laws, God's spiritual laws. And I'm telling you, that's not what Jesus goes on about. Because what we get this morning is this sense you can live by the law if you like. It might be your way to life by following, trying to follow every law of the scripture. It might be your salvation. It might be where your life comes alive. But you've got 1,613 laws to keep in mind and 10 commandments. Or you can take the pathway that says, you know what, I'm going to try and follow in the way of Jesus. I'm going to live by the commandments that he has distilled down, the laws that he has distilled down for us. About loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. Loving our neighbour as we love ourselves. By holding the words of the prophet. And letting that be the challenge in our lives when we get up each day. How can I love my neighbour? Friends, that's where our light shines. That's where our light has the opportunity to shine. You see, the gift that Jesus, I think Jesus gives us in all of this is that life isn't meant to be a set of boundaries. It's not meant to be an electric fence. God's view of us is not meant to be like an electric fence. Don't do this, don't do that. Where Jesus brings it to life for us is in this space of freedom. The freedom to love, to choose to love. And that, my friends, is the heart of the law as Jesus interprets it for the people 
who are 1,500 years after the law is, is written up. That's the contextual work he has done for them. He said, all of the law comes down to this. This is what the law and the prophets are about. This is where you can be salt of the earth, a flavour that, that has a purpose. You can be the light. You can come and light your light off this light. And let it shine in the world. And you and I, in doing so, are living lives that are pleasing to God. It doesn't abolish the law. It distills it down. And it helps us to be contextual in our lives. Our world will always need us to be loving people. Always. I've been alive 59 and a half years. And for all of my breathing and living days, the world is needed to be a more loving place. And I rather suspect for the 2,000 years before me, it's been like that. And I suspect for the 2,000 years after me, it will be like that. And as long as you and I have breath, I don't care how old you are, you're not too old to love. In your context, in your lives, in God's world. That'll do it. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to invite you uh, to stand. We're going to sing the Harvest of Justice.
Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to worship on behalf of our church council and our teams of elders and pastoral carers. Our uh, new sheet has been produced for us uh, again this week, and uh, the invitation is there to our friends uh, further afield. Uh, please get in touch with us at admin at coromaluniting.org.au and we can pass on the information on what we're uh, involved in from our base here in Coromel. Um, a couple of things, well, one particular one that missed the publication of the newsletter, if I can get my sheets to open on time. Um, our mission worker at the University of Wollongong, who we know, um, do, Reverend Duar Leeming um, has two part-time Uniting Church mission worker positions available uh, to work alongside Duar. So um, there are further details available. If people want to contact Graham or John Bremner, we can get that information uh, to them. The closing date for the applications is the 17th of February, so that's not far away. So if people feel on their hearts that they would be interested in participating in that mission, um, please get in touch. Also, um, if I find my sheets, here we go. Uh, we've been sent some information from our Presbytery Administrator, Vi Richardson, uh, about a celebration event uh, for Presbytery, uh, and that's uh, Saturday the 18th of February, so that's not far away either. So. Um, the Presbytery would like um, to gather um, representatives from all of the congregations to a celebration event. So um, if there are groups and individuals in our community who would like to perform a musical number or make an activity um, to present about the life of our work here at Coromel uh, at that event, um, if I would like Coromel United to be part of the team. So Graham is the person to have a chat to if you have ideas that I uh, think would uh, be a good presentation on our behalf. At that point, I'd like to hand over to our Congregational Chair, David Harmon. And uh, thank you, David. I'm going to make an announcement about the way that Coromel Uniting Church can be involved in the upcoming referendum about a voice to parliament. So most of us will know that this has become a topical uh, issue in Australia uh, at the moment. There's a, a, a tension going on that we see reported through the news. Let's start with the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I think th this is the place to start because th this is really the statement upon which the voice is based. It's only 250 words, so this won't take very long. We gather at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent lands, and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 600,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to the, be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better, of sovereignty. It's never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise? That peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years. With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from their families at unprecedented rates. 
This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of the problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments <coughs> but me and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967 we were counted, in 2017 we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. So that's the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It articulates a desire among Indigenous Australians for three things, truth-telling, treaty and voice to Parliament. The referendum this year deals only with the voice to Parliament, but truth-telling and treaty come later. I read the other day that half of the Aboriginal people in the Sydney Basin were wiped out by Governor Arthur Phillips' troops within the first year of settlement. Why is a voice to Parliament important? Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have had representation before regarding how processes of government affect their lives through ATSIC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Commission, which operated from 1990 until 2005. A voice to Parliament will not only once again provide an Indigenous perspective in government decisions, but since it's enshrined in the Constitution, it cannot be abolished by a future government decision, which ATSIC was. Furthermore, Indigenous Australians are the group which has the worst prospects on life expectancy, health, education, employment, household income, housing, and sadly, child abuse. Governments have tried to fix these problems, but consultation of Indigenous Australians has sadly been lacking in most cases. Why should Christians be supportive, you might be asking? Well, a Christian vision of your will be done as in heaven is for a just and compassionate world in which all people have the opportunity to achieve their God-given potential. The dispossession and oppression of First Nations people in Australia is an injustice which has resulted in many being robbed of that opportunity. Are Christians supportive? Well, there's been a joint resolution of Australian religious leaders in 2022, which Sharon Hollis, the president of the Uniting Church, signed on behalf of the UCA. And to quote her, as leaders representing diverse religious communities, we declare our support of the Uluru Statement and its call for a First Nations voice guaranteed by the Constitution. We endorse this reform as necessary, right and reasonable. Indigenous Australians must now be afforded their rightful place in the Australian Constitution. The Uniting Church has supported the Uluru Statement from the heart since it was offered as a gift to the Australian people in 2017. It was endorsed by the Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress, which was referenced in the Uniting Church's Assembly decision to recognise the First Peoples as sovereign in 2018. Other churches who have also signed are the Anglican, the Catholic and the National Council of Churches. Other religions include Judaism, Islam, Sikhism, Buddhism and Hinduism. What about support in the general community? So in a recent survey, 80%, that's four in five, of Indigenous Australians were in, in support of a voice to Parliament. Unfortunately, due to campaigns of the, the no groups, 
Support from the general community has been declining. It was 65% in July last year. It fell to 53% in December. In January, it's 47%. So we'll be aware that the National Party have disappointingly taken a negative stance, and there's concern about the way in which the Liberal Party will go. Let's be reminded, though, that this is not about which political party we support. It's not a Greens or a Liberal or a National or a Labor or an independent issue. Individual Australians are voting on whether they would like to see measures taken to address the lives of their fellow Indigenous Australians. Some of us might know that the Australian Constitution was drafted in the 1890s by the British using the model of the American Constitution, uh, without a revolution, of course. Uh, so it will come as little surprise that Indigenous Australians have been legally invisible for so long. Will a voice to Parliament fix everything straight away? No. It's just the beginning of a longer process of addressing the many difficulties facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Will it work? Well, we don't know. But we, what we do know is that the current approaches are not working very well. Voltaire once wrote that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Making a start, however imperfect it may seem, is the important thing. As people of faith, <coughs> pardon me, we've learned how to trust in the work of God despite a lack of certainty. How can Coromel Uniting be involved? I would like to have a ballot at our upcoming congregational meeting in a month or so where we try to decide as a congregation to make a resolution to support a voice to parliament. A secret ballot can be held if that's what people want to allow people to make up their own minds without pressure from others. Discussions have already started as well about making contact with other churches in Coromel to see whether we can work together as a suburb to provide a Christian witness for the Yes campaign. So I'm happy to take uh, questions on this. We won't do it in the worship service, but please come and see me uh, either at morning tea or, or after that. Um, I'm interested in your views. Now I get to uh, put on the prayer hat and let's move to our prayers of the people. And uh, we've heard several things this morning that we can uh, add to our prayer life. Uh, I'll acknowledge that my prayer is built on a, a book called Together in Worship and Prayer Year A. It comes from the same group that uh, the Uniting Church uses for our other worship materials like our uh, services of, uh, of the sacraments. And the lectionary, of course. So, let's come before God in prayer. Lord Jesus, you showed care for all people in your heart and on your lips. Show us where our voices are needed today. Grant us courage and wisdom to speak clearly to support those who are powerless and weep for justice and compassion. Grant that we may be faithful to stay the course even when there seems little response, to stand firmly before those who could deliver change. In our world, Father, we pray for the people of Ukraine, both in the midst of war and those in safety here but fearing for their families. We pray for so many parts of the Middle East where generational mistrust devalues human life where culture forms an excuse for an injustice and a circle of violence is the official response. In our own nation, Lord, our many clear blessings taken for granted have left us unprepared for hard times. Homelessness, economic stress and social breakdown are widespread and troubling. We pray for resilience and strength for the many agencies, some acknowledging you as their core to continue to function in meeting these challenges. Silently, Father, we lift those known personally to us to you this day. We ask that they will experience your presence, your comfort and your healing. 
Hear our prayer, Lord of love. Enable your church with prophetic leadership to challenge decisions that are lacking in love. Guide our prayers towards action and works for good in this community. You are the God who never gives up and we are thankful. By your spirit, we are never alone in our efforts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, David, too. Um, good leadership. Um, just a couple of quick announcements I wanted to make that were in. The, one is just to let you know that uh, for our young adults and youth and families, we're doing something next Sunday night. So if you would like to be part of that, to talk to either Kim or myself. Um, and, and the other one was that um, uh, tomorrow is David Goss's 90th birthday. David's not with us this morning, he's in Canberra uh, with friends and family. But, uh, but just you might want to hold David in your prayers, he's made it to 90, so well done. And I think, this, uh, and I think and he's having bringing cake next week. Um, and today I think we're having cake for Norma, is that right Norma? We're having, we're having cake, well done. That's uh, the best part of people having big birthdays is we get cake. So uh, always thinking about others I am, you know, <laughs> not my own sweet tooth. All right, um, but just Norma, we'll sing you happy birthday out in the hall. So. Um, how about if now we sing again? We're going to conclude our singing for today with praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's stand together. Let's give, uh, let's, 
bring our, our offerings. Um, there is a retiring offering as you leave if you would like to make your contribution that way. God, we give thanks for all the blessings that flow our way. And so, Lord, we bring back to you that which you give to us, the gifts of our lives, the gifts of our money, the gifts of our time, the gifts of ourselves. Lord, we pray that you would use these gifts as a blessing to those around us for your work, for your glory. Lord, may our good works shine. May they shine your light and bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, go forth in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Honour all people. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Help the afflicted. Support the weak. And in so doing, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.